Howdy once again, it's Mr. Pete, your internet shop teacher, and this is episode number 62A, the question portion of my What Is It Mystery Tool Mystery Item series. And today I've got three items here on the table and then several more that are extra credit. But before I get to this, let me back up and do an update on some items that were... Uh, not correct in the last episode. So let me do that first and then we'll talk about these. Well, you remember this from last time. It's a Brown and Sharp number 577 gauge and I incorrectly told you that it was for uh, measuring an Acme threading tool. And I even held it up like this. And I was wrong on that. Not by too much, but let me uh, show you a page that somebody sent me from the Brown and Sharp 1924 catalog and thank you Rick Sharp he was the first one but there was at least a dozen people that corrected me and had a copy of that old catalog but what I don't understand is that nobody had that answer for uh, episode A nor did they for episode B but then in the follow-up comments of episode B umpteen people told me what this is. So let me show the original catalog page. So there it is. And this was probably in several catalogs, but evidently then discontinued. But at $6.75, that would equal $102 now. But what this is for is for uh, grinding in our case here, the 29 degree worm thread tool. Not Acme, but worm thread, which also was a 29 degree form as noted on the tool. This one says 60, but mine says 29. And then uh, I will give you a close up here of the description so you can stop and pause your video to read this if you want. Actually, that was Joseph Scarborough that sent me the previous clip. This one was sent to me by Rick Sharp. Thank you to both of you and the others that contributed. But this is what they showed in the same catalog, and this is tool number 576, and it truly is used to uh, measure a threading tool when you're grinding it. In this case, uh, we'd be interested in the 29 degree, but they also had it for 60 and 55 would have been for, for Whitworth for grinding that tool. And that would have been extremely expensive at that time. E equivalent probably of two or three hundred dollars. I never did see one of these in the flesh. I had no idea they existed because this is what we use both in the Brown and Sharp version and the steric version and I think everybody and his brother made one about like this and even this is a is a fifty dollar tool if you bought it new. Alright let's go on to something else. But first pause your video if you are interested in reading this page for tool number 576. Well I'm sitting at my computer right now and a long time ago, do you remember this tool? That was in episode number 51A. And I think we did have it correct, but Rod from out in Kansas sent me a copy of the catalog, or a picture of the catalog with the description of this. So let's take a look at that real quickly. And thank you, Rod. So somehow or another, Rod Rogers got a hold of a copy of the central catalog. And in it is the item here, and it is correctly called a crankshaft main journal gauge. And I forgot what the price was originally, but right now, originally it was $114 in 1978, which would be equivalent of $455. So you can pause your video and read that description if you're interested in that. 
And Rod also sent this picture, but it doesn't show up very well. But can you see that this is an automobile crankshaft, and he's measuring across one of the journals. All right, let's get down to business. This is item number one, loaned to me by my friend John, who owns the steam locomotive. And I put some clay on there to cover up the name because it actually tells what it does. There is a patent pending and it's aluminum. Got some ribs in here and depressions on the outside for a grip, obviously for a grip. So what does this tool do? What's it for? It might be an easy one. Of course they're, they're always easy if you know what it is, but if you don't that's difficult, but I think that this might be obvious here in the Midwest. I don't know. So that's item one. Now items two and three were loaned to me by my friend Gary, who is a clockmaker, a clock repairman, and uh, is a volunteer at the West Clocks Museum over in Peru. But this is just a gorgeous little hammer, number two. It's nickel plated. There is no name on it, but the head here is a triangle and it turns and rather than strike like that I, I believe that it is meant for you to put into position and then tap it you know with another hammer but I'm not positive on that but you can see that either this has been beat by another hammer or somebody pounded like this I really do not know in quite good shape but you can see that it has been used the handles perfect hickory rather elegant and thin right here I have no idea I hope that someone out there can identify it thank you for your comments and for participating I usually do not answer the comments in this series here's a tool I think this is easy I think I know what it is. It's pretty obvious actually. It's got a number on it, H50, but no name. And look at the end of it. That's been ground or repaired or something. Also plated, but it appears to be chrome rather than nickel. That's also from Gary. So what is number three? Item four is not a tool, but it's a mystery item, and I think it's an interesting one. I've taken this out of a book. It's from 1906, and there are three of these. I'm going to call them towers. Now, if you're 60 or older, you're going to know what these are because you re re will remember seeing them really all over the country. Maybe they're still used some places, but I, I don't know for sure. Notice that they are at a different height. In other words, this one, uh, they're not under construction. They are uh, finished and in use. But why is this one so much higher within the framework than the other ones? And this is along a canal in the Chicagoland area. That's the canal that turned the Chicago River backwards if you're familiar with that story so uh, what is number four uh, I found it interesting because I do remember these probably even up to the time when I got married there was one in the city of La Salle and my dad explained it to me when I was a kid okay that completes the video four items but stay tuned if you're interested for two extra credit items so stay after school with me first of all I didn't get many comments on that last video where I showed uh, a caricature but who is this man with the wrench in his hand sitting on a gear fairly easy one and the caricature is by the artist David Levine well, let's go up to my computer for the last item. Remember the ginkgo tree? And I had an awful lot of comments on the ginkgo tree, so there must be some interest in trees. But I have another tree for you to take a look at. But it's on my computer, and I ran across this tree very recently when I was taking a bike ride along the Illinois-Mississippi Canal. Feeder Canal, actually. 
All right, this is a short video that I made on my phone when I was on a bike ride. So let's watch the video and see if you can identify this tree. Here's an interesting tree for you. It has very large leaves. Leaves. Interesting trunk. It's a mature tree. We used to have one of these in our neighborhood when I was a kid. Look at the size of that leaf. And it produces these pods, which can be kind of messy on the sidewalk. Yes, what is it? I think this is a fairly easy one. You can see here how large that leaf is compared to my hand. And these are a very undesirable tree to have in your yard because they're messy. They are very fast growing. Hope you enjoyed the video. This is Tubal Cain saying so long for now and I'll see you next time.